The makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee, the superb blend you know is fresh, present the Chase and Sanborn Hour. And your host, Don Amici. <laughs> This is Don Amici tacking up the welcome sign for Chase and Sanborn with greetings to all our friends from all our friends. To you, from Nelson Eddy, Dorothy Lamour, Robert Arm Brewster, and the Chase and Sanborn Orchestra, and with cordial salutations to our guests, Fred McMurray and Helen Broderick. Tonight, we're beating the drums of happiness and blowing the trumpets of joy as we hold reunion with our wistful wanderers fresh off the boat from Honolulu, Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Hey! Welcome home, Edgar. If I'm a like... Oh, no. <laughs> Thanks, Don. It's good to be back. Too. How do you feel, Charlie? Oh, I'm so happy, Miss Jimmy Chill. I'm so happy. Oh, oh, oh. Did you miss me, Charlie? Oh, Dottie, Dee Dee, I did it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Every time I saw a hula girl, I thought of you. <laughs> well, I like that. I did, too. <laughs> I saw so many, I missed you constantly. Did you miss me, too, Charlie? Oh, yes, I did, Mr. Eddie, yes. I just missed everybody except the hula girls. <laughs> did you pick up any Hawaiian while you were down there, Charlie? Oh, several. I mean, yes, yes, indeed, yes. So I mean the Hawaiian language, Oh, Charlie. yes, of course, naturally. Yes, uh, aloha nui kikui. That's Hawaiian, you know. Oh, yeah, what does it mean? Well, it, uh... Well, there are two schools of thought on that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it means Hawaiian. I know that, it's, uh... I know what it means, Charlie. I've uh, the oh, arm Brewster, the actor. Yeah. <laughs> you startled me. Well, what does it mean? Aloha Nui Kaku means greetings to all. <laughs> well done. Well done. And how true. And how unnecessary. <laughs> Take off the grease thing. We know you're nice, show. <laughs> so it's a Lori Nui Kaku added to our hope that you will all enjoy our show and that throughout the week you remain our friends as well as friends of Chase and Sanborn. Nelson Eddy sings the great favorite, Rose Marie, from Rudolph Frimmel's operetta. <laughs> you I'm always dreaming of you no matter what I do I can't forget you sometimes I wish that I had never met you and yet if I should lose you would mean my very life to me of all the queens that ever lived, I chose you to rule me, my rose, my Sweet Rosemary, it's easy to see why all who long to know you, love you. You're gentle and kind, divinely designed, as graceful as the pines above you. There's an angel's breath beneath your sigh There's a little devil in your eye Oh, Rosemary, I love you I'm always dreaming of you no matter what I do, I can't forget you. Sometimes I wish that I had never met you. And yet, if I should lose you, 
would mean my very life to me. Of all the queens that ever lived, I chose you to rule me. My rose, my In the entire field of music, there is no more sweet nor appetizing dish than shortening bread. A dish so tantalizing it brings both joy and trouble to hungry little mouths. Serve it up, Nelson. Put on the skillet, put on the lid. Mama's going to bake a little shortening bread. That ain't all she's going to do. Mama's going to make a little coffee too. Mama's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby loves shortening bread. Mama's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mama's little baby loves shortening bread. Three little darkies lying in bed. Two was sick and other most dead. I sent for the doctor, and the doctor said, I feed those darkies on shortening bread. Mammy's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mammy's little baby loves shortening bread. Mammy's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mammy's little baby loves shortening bread. I slip to the kitchen, slip off the lid, slip my pockets full of shortening bread. I stole the skillet, stole the lid, stole the gal to make shortening bread. Mammy's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mammy's little baby loves shortening bread. Mammy's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mammy's little baby loves shortening bread. And they caught me with the skillet, caught me with the lid, caught me with a gal making shortening bread. I paid six dollars for the skillet, paid six dollars for the lid. I spent six months in jail eating shortening bread. Mammy's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mammy's little baby loves shortening bread. Mammy's little baby loves shortening, shortening. Mammy's little baby loves shortening bread. Yeah. Shortening, shortening bread. I said bread. <laughs> uh, it certainly seems like home again to hear shortening bread. Why, don't you like the song, Charlie? Oh, yes, 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 I like it. Every time I hear it, I like it. Uh. Oh, just what does that mean? Well, Mr. Eddy, you forced me to remind you that on January 1st, 1939, you resolved a uh, quote... At point of gun or threat of lead, I shall not sing no shortening bread. Unquote. Apologize. Mm. You have a fatal memory, Charlie. <laughs> but let me remind you that the statement, quote, uh, I shall not sing no shortening bread, yeah. unquote, yeah. contains two negatives, not and no, yeah. thereby making it a positive. Well, how perfectly subjunctive. <laughs> Now, oh, never mind that, Charlie. What about the gifts you promised to bring us back from Honolulu? Oh, yes, of course, of course, the gifts, yes. You have them? Uh, uh, well, Miss Eddie, you know how it is. There's packing and unpacking and custom offices. Oh, you know how it is. Uh, don't say you haven't got them. Uh, no. No, I don't say that, no. Well, what will I say? <laughs> you see, I had I had them put in in great big packing cases. See, yeah, yeah yes, mm -hmm. and and just to be sure that they would be handled carefully, I marked them uh, fragile china. See, yes, yes. yes. Well, that's where they went uh, <laughs> to fragile china. Uh, wonder where they'd gone if I'd marked them this end up. <laughs> 
<laughs> Charlie, never mind about the presents. All we care about is your presents. Uh, 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 oh, Mr. Michi Witty, it was. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> oh, it's awful. Look, really. Charlie, Jeff, good time in Honolulu. Oh, oh. Well? <laughs> oh, I judge you enjoyed it, eh, Charlie? Uh, it was wonderful, Mr. Nietzsche. Wonderful. I went surfing, you know, too. Yeah. Yeah, I tell you, I had more fun on those uh, sea-going ironing boards. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> Edgar, did you ride the surfboards, too? Oh, oh, yes, Don. It's yeah. a great sport, you know, for building up the muscles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As I wish you could have seen me standing on that board, riding in on the waves. <laughs> yeah, I wish you could, too. <laughs> He looked like a wishbone standing on an empty platter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Did you do much swimming? Well, uh, that reminds me. You know, Mr. Nietzsche Bergen bet me two dollars that he could stay under the water longer than I could, see? Oh, yeah? Who won? Yeah. Well, Bergen did, uh, after a fashion. Yeah. But they had to go down and fetch him up, see? <laughs> and they had to use a pole motor on him, too. <laughs> He'll do anything for money, that guy. <laughs> Well, now, that Charlie was an accident. You know, I almost drowned. Yeah. Where did you find Edgar, Charlie? Under a shell? Yeah, yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah, it was the old shell game with a new nut. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a colleague of mine pulled him out. Yeah. He was a beachcomber by trade. Oh, beachcomber, huh? Yes, beachcomber, yes. Beachcomber. That's Hawaiian for a bum. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, Charlie. He was a has-been. No, it just doesn't want to be. <laughs> What a life that guy leads. All he does is fish and swim and lie out in the sand. Oh, that's the life, all right. Yeah, let somebody else do all the work, eh? Yeah, that's what he does, yeah. yeah. He's a sort of a barefoot Bergen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that will do so. He doesn't care for that crack, no. <laughs> you know, Mr. Nietzsche, ask Bergen about the girl he met on the boat. Go oh. Romance on the high seas. Oh, yeah, yes. Yes, she was very nice, Don. Very nice. Yeah. The society? Yes, oh, yes. Uh. For the prevention of cruelty to animals. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, she is very popular in Boston society. Yeah. Yes, she's the Boston cream of society. But she curdled. <laughs> That's not true. No? No. She came out last winter. Yeah. Saw a shadow and went right back in again. <laughs> What's her name, Edgar? Utsums. Utsums? No, no, no. That's not true. Well, no. That's what you call her. No, no. I called her Daphne. <laughs> and she certainly was, too. <laughs> well, that's enough, Charlie. Daphne's a very nice girl. Yes. Very nice. Uh-huh. She has lots of personality. Uh-huh. Comes from a very wealthy family. Uh-huh. And as homely as they make them. <laughs> She's sweet, demure, fine. And homely as they make them. Uh-huh. She wears her teeth parted in the middle. All oh, right. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's all Charlie thinks about. Uh, Girls who are beautiful. Well, you can't hate a guy for that. <laughs> Daphne has more than looks. Yeah, she has anything but looks. Yeah. She has a monopoly on crow's feet. No, no, listen. <laughs> no. After all, it's time that you realize, Charlie, that, that beauty, beauty is only skin deep. Well, that's deep enough for me. <laughs> I'm no cannibal. No, <laughs> no. Uh, Boy, yes. she really sounds a mess. You think you're kidding. <laughs> Charlie, I resent that. Why? Well, she's a lovely girl, Don. Yeah. Yes, in the evenings we would sit up on the boat deck there with the wind blowing through our hair. Yeah. <laughs> blowing through what? <our>, yeah. <laughs> Edgar, look, tell us, uh, you can trust us. Uh, well, what, what did you two talk about, eh? Oh, nothing, Don. His usual subject, yeah. <laughs> uh, we had such perfect understanding, I don't know, we would sit for hours in silence, uh, just gazing at each other. Uh. Couldn't have been very pleasant for either one of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you bring her around sometime, Edgar, and give us the privilege of meeting her. Yes. How about next week? No, I'm afraid not, Don, no. Well, say two weeks from now. No, no, I don't think I can bring her then either. How about Halloween? No, no. <laughs> Don, do you frighten easily? <laughs> well, Don, I'm afraid that I'll never see her again. Oh, well, that's too bad, Edgar. Why not? Well, I'd rather not see. Oh, go on, tell him. Go on. You won't feel good until you do. 
Tell him what happened when you got off the boat. No, no, no. Oh, not that. Come on, come on. No, Ed, really, I don't. No, I'd rather not. No. Well, then I'll tell you. Now, Charlie. No, what no, what no. happened, Charlie? <laughs> I must tell. <laughs> you see, we were getting off the gangplank, see? Yeah. And uh, and Bergen was helping Daffy, you know, with her luggage. Daffy. All right, so be it. And uh, when, when a man with a long beard ups and kissed her, see? Yeah. Oh, he did. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. And Bergen said, Now, Charlie, please. I got to do it, Bergen. I got to <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so A number one chump says, all right, Charlie. <laughs> Bergen says, see here, sir, you know, brave like, see? Yeah. See here, sir, just because you're an old man gives you no right to get fresh with young girls. See? Well, that was very chivalrous of you, Edgar. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it was, yeah. Didn't, uh, didn't the old man know Daphne? No, her Daphne was his mother. All right, love you. <laughs> Well, mistakes are human. Yeah, but you're the only one who falls in love with them. <laughs> with Charlie back in our midst, we'd expect that his sweetie pie, Dorothy Lamour, would be in a very happy frame of mind. And so she is. But lest Charlie get too sure of his romantic standing, Dottie comes through with a tune tinged with blue. A song all about a melancholy mood. So, Dorothy, tell us your tuneful tale. Melancholy mood Forever haunts me, steals upon me in the night Forever taunts me, oh what a lonely soul am I Stranded high and dry by melancholy mood Gone is every joy and inspiration Tears are all I have to show no consolation, all I can see is grief and gloom Till the crack of doom, oh, melancholy mood Deep in the night I search for a trace of a lingering kiss A warm embrace, but love is a whimsy as flimsy as lace And my arms embrace have empty space Melancholy mood Why must you bind me Pity me and break the chains The chains that bind me Won't you release me Set me free Bring him back to me Oh, melancholy mood But love is a whimsy as flimsy as lace And my arms embrace an empty space Oh, melancholy mood, why must you bind me? Pity me and break the chains The chains that bind me, won't you release me? Set me free Bring him back to me, oh, melancholy mood, melancholy mood, set me free. It says in the book that he who hesitates is lost, there's no time like the present, Never put off till tomorrow, and time is money. Well, that all applies to this piece of news. Yes, you'd better hurry if you want to win $2,500 in cash or one of 1,500 crisp new $5 bills because those prizes will go to people who write in before our contest closes September 30th. 
After that, if you win the big prize, you can begin building a home, send your children to college, get a big new car, pay all your bills, buy new clothes and furniture. Just imagine, $2,500 all in one lump for you. And don't forget those hundreds of other prizes. Crisp new $5 bills to buy something nice for the house or the children. All you do is tell why you changed to Chase and Sanborn Coffee. In recent years, more people have changed to it than to any other kind. Everybody had a reason. We want yours. Did you discover its marvelous flavor in the home of a friend? Did you change to save money or to be sure of freshly roasted coffee rushed from the roasting ovens with the delivery date right on the new silver package? Tell us. After you buy your Chase and Sanborn dated coffee in the new silver package tomorrow, take the dated front of the silver package and write on the inside... I change to Chase and Sanborn coffee because... And finish that sentence in 25 words or less. Be sincere, original, and clear. That's what counts. Mail your entries to Chase and Sanborn, 420 Lexington Avenue. That's 420 Lexington Avenue, New York City. Remember, first prize is $2,500. But your letter must be postmarked before midnight, Saturday, September 30th. Mail yours tomorrow. <laughs> Our visitor this evening, Fred McMurray, is a man of many talents. For besides being an actor of proven ability, Fred, if challenged, can match notes for the hottest of saxophone players and do a swell bit of singing on the side. Fred's latest screen romance is pictured in Paramount's production, Honeymoon in Bali. And it is my pleasure to appear with Fred McMurray in John Whedon's original radio sketch entitled, Brenda. The scene is the living room of a small New York apartment. On a billowing love seat, too low for comfort, perches Gerald Reeves, alone, waiting. While in the hall, Tessie, the maid, hurries to answer a knock on the door. Why, Mr. Mike. Hello, Tessie. Miss Brenda in? Why, 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 I thought you was in Washington. I was. Miss Brenda in? No, 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 sir. She ain't. She sent me in. Tessie, if you're lying to me, I'll break that fat neck of yours. Honest to goodness, Mr. Mike. She ain't in, and that's a fact. Then I'll wait. She ain't in, Mr. Mike. Honest. So I heard. I'll wait. Well, I don't know when she's coming back. She might be kind of a long time. I don't know. Maybe she ain't coming back at all tonight. She don't tell me nothing. I don't know. She'll be back. She forgot her hat. A hat? Yeah, there on the table. And her cane. Oh, that ain't hers, Mr. Mike. You know that. It belongs to Mr. What's-His-Name in the living room. He been waiting, too. Well, if Mr. What's-His-Name has no objection, I'll join the line. Yes, sir. You just step inside and make yourself at home. She's 20 minutes late already, but I'll tell her you here when she comes. Don't bother. I'll tell her myself. And a few more things besides. Well, goodness knows I've done what I could, but I can't do any more. Oh. Good afternoon. Oh, hi. Hot day, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, been hot, all right. <laughs> rather a warm situation, too. Yes, it's... What's that? I say, it's rather a warm situation, you and I meeting here like this. How's that? You're Mike Kearney, of course. Yeah. I'm Gerald Reeves. Oh, hi. A friend of Brenda's. Oh. <laughs> Great girl, Brenda. Yeah, yeah, great girl. I thought, uh, thought perhaps you'd heard of me. No, I don't think I... Hey. You're not the guy that... Yes, uh, sir. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm the guy. <laughs> well, what do you know? <laughs> I, uh, I had no idea, of course, that, uh, you were going to be here this afternoon. Uh, not that that would have made any difference, you mean, but, uh... She just said drop in. So. Well, I'm sorry if I'm busting up the party, but I had a couple of things on my mind I wouldn't keep. Oh, I'm glad to have you. Glad you came. Yeah. Glad you came. Yeah. I can imagine. No, no, really. All I meant was that I wasn't expecting you. No, neither was Brenda. Right now, I'm supposed to be down in Washington, eating my heart out on the government's time. Flying up here was just a little idea of my own. Oh, I see it. Sort of a surprise for Brenda, huh? Yeah, yeah, I thought it'd be kind of nice. <laughs> and only right, considering that she handed me quite a little surprise after I got to Washington. I don't know why I'm pouring out my heart to you. By all the rules, I suppose I should be hanging one on your jaw. 
Oh, I'd be glad to waive the rules. Unless you're bent on making a scene, in which case I suppose the gentlemanly thing would be to get it over before Brenda returns. No, I've got nothing against you. I'm glad you feel that way about it, if you do. Because to tell the truth, I don't uh, altogether relish the position I seem to find myself in here. I, uh, I mean, being the interloper. I'm the interloper. I, uh, I understood that everything was over between you two. Yeah, that's what Brenda thought. And that's the way she'd like it. What she doesn't realize is you can't end these little affairs just by sending your regrets. It isn't as easy as that. No, I... I found that out. You... Uh... Yes, you see, I was engaged myself. That, that is, until about a week ago, I was. Oh, you were, huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, and then Brenda comes along in all the glory and takes you for herself, huh? Well, now, wait a minute. You're making it sound a little nasty. Yeah, well, don't let that worry you. The same thing happened to me. Oh. Well, <laughs> I guess it's always a pretty awkward situation all around. I... I don't know how it was with you, but Elaine, uh, my fiancée, that is, uh, she didn't take it very well, I thought. I mean, even making due allowances. Because uh, after all, it wasn't our fault. I, mine or Brenda's, it wasn't anything that we wanted to happen at uh, either of us. That statement has an old familiar ring. No, no, really. Uh, we, we fought against it. It was, uh, it was just something that was bigger than either of us. It, uh, it overpowered us. Yeah, sure. <laughs> you were probably a little out of condition anyway. Yes, we probably... <laughs> What? It was really fate that was to blame, wouldn't you say? I'm sure Brenda would. Yeah, yes, as a matter of fact, she did. Yeah, sure. Fate is Brenda's best friend. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> it was the purest chance that threw us together. I was going down to Bermuda with the family, and my fiancé was to come down and visit us later. But as it turned out, it... well, that's neither here nor there. But uh, then Brenda turned up unexpectedly on the same boat. Yeah, it was a pretty sudden decision, as I remembered. A sudden urge to get away from it all. Whatever it was. Me, probably. Oh, no, no. There was nothing prearranged about it, believe me. Yeah, I believe you. That is, I believe you. I'd met Brenda once or twice before that, naturally, but I mean, I, I'd never given her second thought. I, and then we were thrown together that way. You, you know how it is on the boat, and, uh, and it, well, it just happened. And so, <laughs> here we are. Yeah, and here I am. <laughs> yeah. You know, you've been very decent about this. Do you mind my being quite frank with you? No, go right ahead. We're bound to get down to that sooner or later. I'm sorry to say it, but uh, if you come here to plead with Brenda, I can tell you it won't do any good. Oh, you can, huh? Yes, I can. Mm. I know from the way Brenda's talked to me about the, uh, the whole thing. Yeah, well, I haven't come all the way up here from Washington, D.C. to ball in her lap, I can tell you that. Then what have you come for? Can't you see that you'd save yourself a lot of humiliation and uh, spare Brenda a good deal of unpleasantness by just accepting matters as they are? It's unfortunate, but... Uh, well, the fact is that she doesn't love you. Why not let her go at that? You know Brenda pretty well, do you? I think I uh, understand her. That's your first mistake. I've known her for two years, and I never understood her until this morning. But I, I don't want to say anything against Brenda, because she's, uh, she's a great girl, if you like the type. Now, look, I know you've got a right to feel badly about losing her, but uh, now that it's over, why not take it like a man? Yeah, I suppose I should. I don't know. But it all seems to be working out too smoothly. For her, I mean. They were switching me to the attorney general's office. She knew that a month ago when she got back from Bermuda. But she said nothing. She strung me along until it was time for me to leave for Washington. And even then, not a word. Last night, she kisses me a fond farewell, the loving fiancé. Then, this morning, when I get down there, there's a letter from her waiting for me. Just as simple as that. No scene, no fuss. Ah, it's beautiful. <laughs> she did that. Yeah, she did. Well, you're sort of unkind, I guess, but... Uh, well, after all, the poor kid, she's kind of sensitive. You, you know how she dislikes scenes. Yeah, yeah, poor kid. Sure. <laughs> she uh, probably didn't fully realize how you felt. Oh, no, no, of course not. As a matter of fact, it's probably pretty rotten to me to come up here at all. Oh, no, 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 there's no use tearing yourself down, old man. I know how you felt. And anyway, there's no harm done. You can leave and <laughs> she'll never know. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. There's just one thing. Yes? Uh, before I go, uh, let me read you a couple of passages out of this letter here. The letter you got? Yeah, yeah, the letter I received this morning in Washington. The letter from Brenda. I'm sorry, Kearney, but I'm afraid Brenda wouldn't care to have me hear this. Yeah, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you had something there. But I'm going to read it anyway. Let's see. Uh, Michael, dear... Yeah, yeah, here it is. Yes, Michael. Kearney, are you going to put that letter away or do I have to make you? Oh, now, make sense, will you, Reeves? I'm not reading this out of spite, and I'm not going to read anything I shouldn't. It's just, uh, well, I want you to hear what your dream girl has to say about you. There's no harm in that, is it? Well, all right. All right. 
Yes, Michael, she says. Yes, Michael, there is another man. He isn't half the man you are. That's you she's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. He isn't half the man you are, but he needs me. And anyway, Michael, you'll understand that a girl has to think of the future. There's more to life than the thrills and excitement of the present. And love... Well, Michael, you know as well as I do that love is fine while it lasts, but when it goes, there must be something more practical to take its place. Kearney, are you... I mean, she did write that? You want to see it? No, 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 thank you. Oh, that gives you an idea. It does that, yes. But don't let it get you, old man. Let it get you. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Kearney, there's one thing I'd like you to believe. When I first met Brenda, I had no idea that I was, well, butting in on anything. Oh, well, forget it. All's fair in love and war. No, 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 no. I don't believe that. I never have. And under the circumstances, I think the only decent thing for me to do is bow out and let you patch it up with Brenda if, uh, if you can. Oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want you to feel that way But if you went to her and said, uh, Brenda... what's done is done. Well, but it hardly seems fair. I I mean, you and Brenda have sort of built up a life together. You've got plans and hopes and all that sort of thing, no doubt, and... (laughs) And I come barging in and upset everything. I, well, doggone it, man, it isn't fair. I, I, don't, I don't blame you for resenting. But I don't. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I don't. She's yours, old man, and I wish you nothing but happiness. Oh, thanks. And now I guess I'll be on my way. Oh, no, no. Uh, wait a minute, Kearney. Why? Uh, there's that new musical opening tonight. I thought, uh, well, if you weren't doing anything... I... Well, I'm not, but isn't it a little late to get some tickets? Well, I've got a couple of tickets. Uh, why don't you come with me? With you? Yeah, I... I was going to take a girl, but, uh, well, I'm afraid she couldn't make it. This is Don Amici and the Chase and Sanborn Hour continues as Nelson Eddy sings the gay Non Piu Andrei from Mozart's comic opera, The Marriage of Figaro. Capitano, a me pure la mano, io vuoi parlarti prima che tu parti. Addio, piccolo cherubino, come cangia e non punto il tuo destino. Non ti andrai farfallone amoroso, notte e giorno, d'intorno, girando, delle belle turbando il riposo, narcisetto ad un cino d'amore, delle belle turbando il riposo, narcisetto ad un cino d'amore. Non più avrai questi bei pennacchini. Quel cappello leggero e gallante, quella chioma, quell'aria brillante, quel vermiglio donnesco color, quel vermiglio donnesco color, non più avrai quei pennacchini, quel cappello, quella chioma, quell'aria brillante. Non più andrai far pallone amoroso, notte e giorno d'intorno girando, le belle turbando e reposo, narcisetto ad un cino d'amore, le belle turbando e reposo, narcisetto ad un cino d'amore. Fra guerrieri può far bacco, fra mustachi stretto sacco, Schiappo in spalla, sciabola a fianco, collo dritto, 
nudo franco, un gran casco, un gran turbante, molto nore, poco contante, poco contante, poco contante. Ed in vete del fandango, un amore che per il fango, per la montagna e per i balloni, con le neve e i soglioni, al concerto di trombone, di bombarde, di cannone, che le palle in tutti i tuoni, all'orecchio fan fischiore, non più avrai. Quei pennacchini non ti avrai, quel cappello non ti avrai, quella chioma non ti avrai, quell'ario brillante. Non ti avrai farfallone amoroso, notte e giorno, d'inciorno, girando, e le belle turbando e riposo. Narcisetto ad un cino d'amor, nelle belle turbande reposo, Narcisetto ad un cino d'amor, ero fino alla vittoria, alla gloria militare, ero fino alla vittoria, alla gloria militare, alla gloria militare. Whenever Helen Broderick is billed in a new picture, that's a mighty solid reason for going in to watch the fun. Or she may be an acrid old spinster or a malicious maiden lad, but whatever she is, she's good. It's a real pleasure to welcome one of Hollywood's grandest character actresses, Helen Broderick. <laughs> Hello, Helen. That, uh, that was me you were talking about, wasn't it, Mr. Amici? Well, of course. Well, a sort of a quick thumbnail sketch of a grand old character player. Uh, yes, yeah. Hmm, acrid old spinster. Malicious maiden aunt. That's old Broderick for you. I've been knocking herself out for years. Well, what, what are you talking about, Helen? Oh, don't mind me. I'm just that grand old character actress. You can call me prehistoric Broderick. Oh, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, but Helen. A minute. I've been waiting for years. But, Helen, uh, I... Decrepit old Broderick. Certainly she's not thinking of romance. Not at her age. Well, it's never too late. Oh, What's the use? A character actress I was born and a character actress I'll die. Oh, now, it's not as bad as all that. You'd know, I suppose. You've been a character actress. <laughs> well, no. Uh... Well, then stop horning in on my misery. <laughs> Other girls grow up to be, uh, well, the glamour girls or oomph artists or private secretaries, <laughs> but not Broderick. Oh, now, wait a minute, Helen. A private secretary, for one, has more worries than you have. Uh -huh, not the kind of a private secretary I'd be. <laughs> and just what kind would you be? Well, as a character actress, nothing glamorous, mind you. Just an old character actress. Let me give you an idea. All right. Get this picture. Broderick, the private secretary. Yeah, it's a pretty picture, but I'm glad I'm not the boss. Well, there I am in the office, just clearing up my desk and putting on a new face. It's six o'clock, and I have a heavy date to go to the Bijou and see uh, Don Amici in Hollywood Cavalcade. Oh, thanks, Helen. <laughs> oh, that's nothing, Don. <laughs> well, as I said, there I am, all primped up and ready to blow when... <laughs> wouldn't you know it, there goes my buzzer. It's that balloon face I work for. <laughs> He knows as well as I do that it's way after office hours. All right, all right, all right. Keep your shirt on. I'm coming as fast as I can. Uh, yes, Mr. Whiffle. Did you buzz for me? I'll take a few letters. You mean tonight? <laughs> oh, yes, Mr. Whiffle. Oh, I know it's only six o'clock. Of course, I did have an important engagement tonight. Huh? Oh, well, certainly your letters are important, too. Oh, it isn't that. I... I merely thought the letters would wait till tomorrow morning. I don't think my date will. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Of course I'm not blaming you for that. But when I do get a date... Yes, Mr. Whiffle, I'm sorry. Well, I'm ready for that letter any time you are. What? 
You're going to dictate how many letters? But, Mr. Whiffle, 15... Uh... Yes, Mr. Whiffle. <coughs> <coughs> what? Oh, don't be silly. Oh, I just... I simply love taking dictation from you. Yes, I do. I could just go on taking your letters forever. And it looks like I'm going to. <laughs> oh, 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 I wouldn't have you think I'm dissatisfied here. Oh, no. Well, I'll never forget how proud I was that first day you hired me, remember? You took me down and showed me my own, my very own cheery little office. You know, the one without the windows. <laughs> you opened the door and two bats flew out. <laughs> but I didn't mind. Oh, no, not me. I loved it. Though I did wonder where the janitor would keep his brooms and mops after I moved in. <laughs> and to think I spent three years in that air-heated cubicle. Huh? Oh, why, no, Mr. Whipple. I'm not complaining. Think how good it's been for my claustrophobia. <laughs> And really, I don't mind working with my typewriter in my lap at all. <laughs> yes, Mr. Whipple, these last three years have just been one great, big, wonderful dream. Hmm, yes. Huh? What's that, Mr. Whipple? I'm a... I'm a what? Why, Mr. Whipple, and you a member of the Goodwill Club, too. <laughs> Now, look here, lame brain. For three years, I've been getting calluses on my ears from listening to that dictaphone dictation of yours. Oh, and that reminds me. Have you ever heard that voice of yours on a dictaphone record? Just between the two of us, it's loud. Um, well, uh, it's certainly not good. Hmm? Oh, no, it's not you. It's our dictaphone that's illiterate. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. And while we're clearing things up, why in the name of all that's neat don't you ever pull up your socks? <laughs> you heard me. Yes, your socks. <clears throat> Hereafter, Mr. Whipple, I'll thank you to wear garters or keep your legs off the desk when I'm taking dictation. <laughs> oh, what? There's not going to be any hereafter. Huh. That's what you think, dearie. There's going to be plenty of hereafter. Or Mrs. Jason P. Whiffle. You remember Mrs. Whiffle? Yes. Well, the old battle axe might find the real story about those weekly board meetings you go to very interesting. Mm. Board meetings at ten cents a point. Yes. I thought you'd begin to see this thing reasonably. Well, now I hear my date outside, so toodle-doo, Jason, old dear. Don't forget to turn out the lights when you leave. And oh, yes, if I'm a little late tomorrow morning, don't worry about it. We can talk about my raise when I get in. So long, Whiffy. <laughs> The old-time poets and our modern lyric writers certainly have one thing in common. The majority of their efforts are turned to thoughts of love. We find the latest romantic sentiment expressed in the charming song called My Love for You. I'd like to sing it to you. My love for you is past imagination My love for you Is such a revelation I never could feel before Kisses were real before Heaven was here today And gone tomorrow But now I know that love's no mere sensation, for I'm aglow with joy and adoration. I worship the sight of you, darling, in spite of you, I'll make you mine. Every day, you're all that I want you to be. Every day you seem to be nearer to me, dearer to me. My love for you is like the great elation that Shelley knew when he found inspiration. You can never change it now. 
for it's immortal, my love for you. Imagination, my love for you is such a revelation. You can never change it now, for it's immortal. My love for you. like this is profitable to everyone who hears it, so listen carefully. It means big money to you if you hurry and win this easy contest. $2,500 cash, so don't miss out. Just think of getting $2,500. You could buy a new car, start building a home, send your son or daughter to college, and remember all the other prizes, too. Not just a few, but 1,500 of them. Each one a crisp new $5 bill. This contest closes midnight September 30th. So do this tomorrow after you get your Chase and Sanborn dated coffee in the new silver package from your grocer. Take the dated front of the silver package and write on the inside, I change to Chase and Sanborn coffee because... Then finish that sentence in 25 words or less. All entries become the property of Chase and Sanborn. Our judge's decision is final. In case of ties, we'll give duplicate prizes. The contest is open to everyone in the United States except Chase and Sanborn employees and their families. What makes this contest so easy is the tremendous number of reasons for changing to dated coffee. And such good reasons that in recent years, more people have changed to it than to any other kind. There's the flavor, the freshness, the money you save. And now your reason may bring you $2,500. Send as many entries as you like using one dated silver package front for each entry. Mail to Chase and Sanborn, 420 Lexington Avenue. That's 420 Lexington Avenue, New York City. Send one of your entries tomorrow. Charlie, on your greeting list tonight is an old friend of yours, Fred McMurray. Remember him? Oh, yes, I certainly do. Hello, Mr. McMurray. Or as we say in Hawaii... Hello, Nui Kikui, and I do mean Kikui. <laughs> kikui to you, Itui, Charlie. Uh, please. <laughs> well, the trip seems to have done you a lot of good. You look swell. You uh, didn't get seasick, did you? Uh, no, no, I didn't. But Bergen, uh, Bergen was a picture of Maldonar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I wasn't, no, indeed not. Uh, no, I admit it was a little rough the first day out, but my sea legs, you know. Yeah, well, what about your sea legs? Uh, I didn't get seasick. Oh, oh, I see. Don't you get seasick if you're bow-legged? Well, no, no. <laughs> All right, bow-legged. No, no, listen, don't listen to him, Fred. <laughs> I enjoyed every minute of the trip, and I'm very fond of that Hawaiian food, too. Say, so, Edgar, that uh, poi you hear so much oh, about, how does that taste? That's well, very delicious, Fred. Yes. <laughs> it's made of taro root, and it tastes like wallpaper paste. Did you like it, Charlie? Did I like it? I was stuck on it. <laughs> Well, while we were in Honolulu, we had the good fortune of being invited to a luau. A luau, huh? Yeah. What's that? A luau? It's a sort of a Hawaiian snuggles board. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you see, Mr. McMurray, a luau is a Hawaiian word. I suspected that. Oh, did you? Mm. Yeah. Well, it is nevertheless. You see, it comes from the Polynesian word loho, sometimes called lehi. In the southern part of Polynesia, see. Which, of course, comes from a Balinesian derivative, uh, uh, Luhi. <laughs> Luhi. Yes. Which comes from the Hawaiian word Luau. So there you are. I guess. Uh, so that's that, where the uh, word Luau comes from. Yeah, that'll be three dollars for a trip around the island, see. <laughs> Now that I think of it, where do you come from? Well, I don't know where I come from, but I know where I'm going, and it's out of here and fast. So oh. long, Charlie. 
So long, kid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sensitive, isn't he? <laughs> uh, uh, can't talk to a guy around here. Huh? People aren't as friendly here as they are on the islands. Oh, dear, dear. You know, no kidding. I miss those hula girls. You do? Yes, I do. Oh, so you thought those hula girls were a bit of all right, huh, Charlie? Oh, Miss Janichi, they're lovely. Just lovely. <laughs> oh, they live a beautiful life, those dancers. All they do is just stand around and twiddle their tummies. And... <laughs> well, Charlie, we have a native girl here to greet you. Oh, good. A native of California. Very nice, too. Helen Broderick. Who? Helen Broderick. Oh, character woman, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, you must meet her. Yeah, well, if I must, I must. So, wheel her in. (laughs) I must say that's a fine way to greet a friend, wheel her in. (laughs) Pay no attention to me, Miss Broderick, just ignore me. I'm not myself today. Mm, Well, whoever you are, you're just as disagreeable. Yeah. (laughs) Well, thank you. Uh, Why, Miss Broderick, you shouldn't talk to me that way. I've been away, you know. You yeah. have? Yes, yes. I've been to here in Lilia. <laughs> so what? So, so, hey, Bergen. Yes, yes I... Do I have to be nice to this, uh, th- I mean her? Yes, you do. Yeah? Yes. But she, she... No, 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 never mind that. No. Always act polite. Oh, all right, all right. All right. But I'm only acting. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Broderick... Uh... What is it, Splinter Puss? Why? <laughs> you, Charlie, no, all right, all right. Miss Broderick, uh, I just want to say I think you look beautiful. Hmm. Oh, do you really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, who's your plastic surgeon? Oh. <laughs> Another crack like that, McCarthy, and I'll split you in half and use you for bookends. Oh. <laughs> Listen, you model T loudspeaker. John. <laughs> yes, yes. You'll apologize for that right now. Oh, very well, Mr. Bergen. Miss Broderick, if I've said anything that I'm sorry for, I'm glad. <laughs> well, that's certainly a fine apology. Charlie, will you please remember that Miss Broderick is a very fine actress? Yeah. Yes. Well, I've never seen her mug on the screen. Now, let me get this right. You mean to say you've never seen this face on a screen? Uh, no, I haven't, no. That's odd. I agree with you. (laughs) Nevertheless, I've never seen it. (laughs) Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you what I thought of some of your screen triumphs. Yeah, well, I can explain some of those. You see, Bergen didn't feel well. The lighting was bad. No, 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 no. I, uh... Working against no, no, no. Oh, don't alibi. It wasn't the lighting. It was your face. Oh, my face. Mm. Oh. Yes, it reminded me of something. <laughs> Tyrone Power, perchance? <laughs> no, it reminded me I should have my roof re-shingled. <laughs> <laughs> Is that so, huh? Bergen, you know, there are only two people in this whole world that I really hate. Is that so? Yes. Well, who are they? Why should I mention her name twice? (laughs) Listen, listen, you animated hitching post. I want you to understand you can't insult me. Well, don't say I didn't try. (laughs) This is a fine fiddle of kish, er, fish. What's the matter? I don't know. After I've been feasting my eyes on those beauties in Honolulu, I have to come back here and meet you. Oh. Well, Charlie, people made too much of a fuss over you in Hawaii, and I just thought I'd bring you down to Earth. Down to Earth? You buried me. <laughs> no hard feelings, eh, Charlie? Oh, no. Helen, dear, no, no. <laughs> Not Helen, Charlie. Uh, Miss Broderick. Oh, yes, of course, yes. Yes, Miss Broderick. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, shall we kiss and make up? Oh, we weren't that mad at each other. (laughs) Tell you what I'll do. I'll teach you how to dance the hula, Miss Broderick. Isn't it pretty difficult to learn, Charlie? No. I can teach you in two shakes. (laughs) Well, you know, Helen, Helen, it's very interesting about that hula dancing. You know, every movement has a meaning. Mm. And the gestures uh, in the dance, you know, tell a complete story. That's right, yeah. 
I shall now dance the story of the traveling salesman in Schenectady. <laughs> 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 you can that? Uh, that's enough of that, Charlie. As I was saying, Helen, uh, many of the dances are based on uh, native superstition. Oh, are they? Yes. Are you superstitious, Mrs. Broderick? Mrs. Broderick? <laughs> no, no, not me, thank goodness. Not wood. Oh, ouch, my head. <laughs> what are you squawking about, McCarthy? I got the splinter. Oh, I did. <laughs> Nelson Eddy sings The Blind Plowman, a simple and deeply moving story of everlasting faith. Set my hands upon the plow, my Feet upon the sod, turn my face toward the east and praise be to God. Every year the rains do fall, the seeds they stir and spring. So we come to the end of another Chase and Sandball Hour, and it's homeward bound for us. You know, as the weeks go by, all of us manage to get our share of traveling in. What with Nelson Eddy singing concerts here, there, and everywhere, Edgar and Charlie tripping back and forth to Honolulu, and Dorothy Lamour flying to and from New York, and wherever we go, all the people we meet always greet us with words of praise for Chase and Sanborn coffee. Well, we think they're right, and we hope you do, too. We hope that at your house, the same as at ours, it's Chase and Sanborn coffee every time. We'll all be back next week, and our special guests will be David Niven and Anita Louise. Until next Sunday, then, this is your sincerely Don Amici saying au revoir. Don't forget the cities of New York and San Francisco are making it easy and pleasant for you to visit their two great fairs. In both cities, accommodations for visitors are splendid and reasonably priced, and there's a hearty welcome awaiting you. At the fairs themselves, don't miss the special Chase and Sanborn attractions. At San Francisco Golden Gate Exposition, visit our colorful house of hospitality. In New York, see the magnificent Standard Brands Building, featuring our great outdoor marionette show with puppets of Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, Don Amici, and Dorothy L'Amour. It's fun, it's free, and you're always welcome. This is the National Broadcasting Company.